Good afternoon. Okay. So uh, a couple things we're going to be doing today. Um, our um, our main lecture is going to be on um, soft tissue flaps and muscle flaps. Um, our hold on one second. We got. Okay, um, so we're gonna go be going over uh, muscle flaps and both in the lecture portion and then um, in the lab, the cadaver lab portion. Um, with me today, I have uh, my fellow Dr. Blanton, uh, who will be practicing down in Cincinnati uh, for all those going down there for residency or um, students for externs. Um, so she's gonna be going through a, a case and a part of the lecture at the very end of mine. Um, and then uh, in a little bit, um, one of my um, uh, good friends, Joe Corey, Dr. Uh, Corey, he's a plastic surgeon here in Cleveland. Uh, he's going to be um, uh, working with uh, Dr. Blaine and I, and we'll be doing flaps um, in the uh, one o'clock uh, cadaver portion, which um, we'll, we're gonna obviously be going over to Facebook like we did last time so we can live stream it and then uh, answer any questions anybody has and then we'll flip uh, all that video onto YouTube for anyone who misses it or, or wants to review it again. Okay, so without further ado, let's get this going. So, today's a flap and frame um, uh, lab and discussion. Um, oh, and we also have a uh, external fixator, which is as long as we have time at the end, uh, we're gonna go uh, through kind of um, uh, how to put on a frame uh, for these flaps. So I want to kind of start off just by discussing kind of, you know, uh, what the, the point of limb salvage is, so to speak, uh, why we do what we do. Um, so I'll start off with this uh, study back in 2015. So it's a little dated, but um, uh, the numbers have just increased since that time. Um, in 2015, they found 2 million people in the United States are living with limb loss, most of them of which are uh, vascular pass and diabetics. Um, now their five year, year mortality rate after an amputation is 50%, uh, which is extremely high looking at, you know, comparative to the uh, breast and prostate cancer numbers. And I think the big one here to look at too is 55% of those people who get an amputation, three years later, both of their limbs are missing. So that's a, that's a lot of people losing both of their limbs in an eight year uh, span uh, after an amputation. So a lot of you know, question whether or not it's worth it money wise, right? So besides the patients themselves, uh, there's obviously a financial burden that's put on our system. Um, but look at this study from um, uh, 2007, um, and they actually just came out with a new study, which I'll have to put in this presentation. Uh, but the numbers are about the same. So the cost in the United States for a two-year hospitalization, uh, post-op care, all that stuff, um, and a, um, a prosthetics for um, limb salvage, looking at $91,000, versus the projected lifetime healthcare for a patient who underwent an amputation over half a million dollars. So significant difference here in the healthcare cost uh, associated with limb salvage versus amputation. And we also have to look at our patients themselves, right? So, you know, there's, there's a body or, a, you know, a person attached to all of these patients. Um, and you have to look at what do they want, right? So are they, you know, do they want an amputation? Do they want limb salvage? This Wukic article, I think, really rings true um, and, and, you know, to the heart, so to speak. So you look at patients with diabetic foot pathologies, they fear amputation more than death itself. So these diabetics, <clears throat> excuse me, um, fear um, losing their limb. They'd rather die than lose their limb, right? So uh, that's an extremely, you know, kind of uh, hitting, hitting at home kind of uh, a statistic. These patients with long-term long diabetes, a lot of them have family members who went through the same thing and know kind of what the, uh, what the downstream uh, effects of lo losing their limb causes. So um, kind of diving into these flaps, um, I like to look at this as a team effort. Everything with limb salvage is not one person, it's not two people, it's everyone involved. Everyone from physical therapists, our vascular surgeons and infectious disease doctors, 
and looking at you know um, uh, working with plastic surgeons and foot and ankle surgeons to kind of create this huge team coming together to save these limbs. So in this scenario, we're Thor, the foot and ankle docs are Thor, and we have to know when conservative measures are no longer the answer, no longer uh, a viable um, option for the patients. So a couple things before looking at flaps are um, what I call the preoperative must-haves. So you have to rule out PVD um, and, and address the PVD with a vascular or, or interventional radiologist um, uh, or uh, interventional cardiologist looking at these must-haves. So you have to rule out PVD with non-invasive vascular stu um, studies, uh, clinical exam, um, looking at either MR or CT angios and delineating the extent of the distal perforators uh, which we'll go into in a couple minutes how much blood flow there really is to the leg uh, besides you know our, our classic dp and pt arteries are palpable right so that's not that's not enough to uh, determine the vascular uh, inflow and outflow of the limbs and then going into invasive if needed with um, uh, endovascular or lower extremity bypasses and also uh, addressing the nutrition issues with most of the patients I think every every patient who has a wound, not, not I think, every patient who has a wound has some kind of nutritional deficit that needs um, addressed. And you and you look at their albumin and their prealbumin, um, their transferrin levels, their vitamin D levels, the list goes on and on. These patients are deficient in not one, not two, but multiple of these things that need addressed um, during and then preoperative. Um, um, during treatment and preoperatively. So we look at these um, uh, vascular portions of the patient, um, making sure that their uh, occlusions and uh, issues are addressed from, you know, the thorax all the way down to the toes. We have to look at the available vascular testing that I mentioned before, the ABIs, PVRs, TBIs, which are extremely important for the distal perfusions, um, looking at the ultrasound, the arch, arth, arterial duplex ultrasound, CT, and MR angiograms. Um, these, these studies are essential, um, and you will want to look at not only those numbers, those PVRs, um, I'm sorry, not, not just the ABIs and the TBIs, but also what you see on these printouts, these Doppler signals, they're essential to really looking at the arterial um, uh, issues that the patients have. <laughs> Yes, sorry, dealing with the patient. So you have to look at the, um, these scores, looking at anything less than ABI, anything less than 0 0.5 is essentially um, terrible occlusion disease, um, all the way up to our OK or our moderate uh, PVDs, our normal ABIs, and then our falsely normal ABIs. So that's the other reason we need to look at these waveforms, which I'm gonna go to in uh, a second, is these, these false, negatives, these patients who have decent looking ABIs, but their arterial um, calcifications are giving us false reads on these. Um, TBIs, anything um, greater than 0 0.7, uh, we uh, classify as normal or satisfactory supply. And then we look at our 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.65, anything less than that uh, indicates some kind of vascular intervention that is needed. Uh, this is a terrible picture, but uh, kind of gets to the point of what these vessels look like and what the waveforms look like. So this is a nice um, uh, chart or uh, photo of what a calcified vessel looks like, and that's where our TV, our ABIs uh, become extremely high, um, almost abnormally high. And then these uh, waveforms that are seen on the PVRs are normals, uh, 0 um, uh, 0.9. Uh, to 1.4 being our, you know, somewhat normals, and then down to our mild, moderate, and then severe vascular disease. Um, I just want to show, oops, I just want to show here um, what these different waveforms look like. Our normals have that dichrotic notch, um, which have uh, very good inflow, um, and then um, a subsequent um, outflow of those arterial portions. The mild uh, abnormalities where they have what looks like normal, but then they have no dichrotic notch and a flatter period uh, between the peaks. Moderate, moderately abnormal, um, those peaks start to flatten out. 
Um, and then we obviously, we still have no dichrotic notch. That, that's a nice little uh, TQ or, or buzzword is the dichrotic notch. So when we lose the dichrotic notch, we're in trouble. And then severely abnormal, we almost have a flat line, no peaks, no dichrotic notches, uh, and no amplitude, or sorry, low amplitude um, between each, each um, uh, beat that goes through the, the lower extremities. I think it's um, uh, good to notice or good to note this um, uh, kind of uh, good color by numbers uh, book um, by Zen, which is extremely uh, beneficial when you're looking at flaps, learning flaps uh, from head to toe. Um, so we're gonna go through uh, briefly uh, a couple different classifications and types of flaps before I start to show some of these cases, just so we have a, a nice little generic understanding of all the flaps. So we have random um, uh, pattern flaps uh, where we have um, some subdermal plexus of the arterial flow that goes into the, art, um, into the um, subcutaneous and cutaneous skin um, and arcing that, um, uh, arcing those flaps to where we're trying to cover the, uh, the voids. So this, um, you know, quote unquote random pattern flaps, that's where you hear about your, your bilobes, uh, your monolobes, uh, your transpositional um, uh, rhomboid flaps, et cetera, uh, where you're taking the, the arterial and venous plexus of one area, transposing it somewhere else or rotating it somewhere else, um, and taking all the vascular supply and um, uh, neurological supply with it, um, and then either closing it or delayed uh, closing it later on. We have propeller flaps. Uh, propeller, propeller flaps um, are uh, designed so you're, you have a skin island which you can rotate uh, one way or the other, uh, and you're essentially using that perforating artery that, that goes into the uh, subcutaneous and cutaneous skin uh, and rotating it to where you need that area uh, to be covered. Um, so on the left-hand screen, you have a skin island and you have a perforator artery. You keep that artery intact and you pivot it on that uh, perforator artery. So that's, that's what's known as a propeller flap. Um, next one uh, that we're gonna uh, touch on here is a fascial uh, flap or a fascial cutaneous. Um, I should note now, so this is, this is one of those, um, you know, how, how do I, what do I call this flap and why do I call it? You, you identify a flap by the most superficial and most deep portion that you're taking. So if you're taking a flap that includes skin, subcutaneous tissue, it is a, um, fascia cutaneous, sorry, a fascia cutaneous flap. I had to remember what I just asked. So a fascia cutaneous flap. So you have the, of the hamburger, you have the, the buns on both sides and you, you include everything uh, from top to bottom. Uh, just like a muscle flap is a muscle flap. Um, a um, uh, adipofascial flap is just taking the adipose down to the fascia. So that's the um, uh, next type of flap. Uh, that there is to discuss. Um, our uh, one that we're kind of going to be delving into today is the muscle flap. Uh, so this is a transpositional uh, muscle flap. You can see here um, the arc of rotation of detaching a, a muscle at one portion, keeping the arterial and venous supply uh, into that muscle and changing it or, or uh, transposing it from one area to the other. The other um, uh, Use of this is also to take uh, skin, fat, fascia, and the muscle, um, where you have a myocutaneous flap. So again, from top to bottom, the two buns are the myo or the muscle portion, and then the cutaneous portion and everything comes with it. Obviously, you wanna keep all of the arterial supply that you can um, to supply that area with the blood supply, both arterial and venous. Um, uh, to transpose it or, or um, uh, move that flap to where you want it to go. These are all transpositional um, uh, uses for it. And obviously there's also the free flap uh, portion, which we're not gonna discuss today, uh, but the free flap portion is detaching both the, um, you know, for a myocutaneous flap, you can have a free myocutaneous flap where you're taking um, muscle, fascia, fat, skin, and then <clears throat> taking the arterial supply, the direct arterial supply to that, detaching it from its native, native uh, origin, and then bringing it and transposing it to another location uh, and anastomosing it. 
Um, I'm not going to go in the, that Dr. Bland is going to go into the classification, but there are classifications for everything in medicine and muscle flaps are um, uh, no exceptions to that. And then here's just a diagram. This is uh, copy pasted from the Zen text. Um, you know, most of our flaps uh, are coming from uh, type um, two and four, uh, as well as a few types uh, from uh, type one. I like this um, uh, depiction um, from the Zen text. Again, uh, this is my colors by number reference. Uh, so this is a great um, uh, showcase of where a wound is, um, which is the colored uh, depictions here, uh, and then what kind of flaps can be utilized for each wound in these locations. So we have everything from the knee, upper um, uh, one third, middle and lower of the tibia, medial lower mal, dorsal foot, and then all of the subsequent flaps that can be utilized for these to cover the areas. This text here um, uh, comes from Adinger uh, and Bloom out in um, uh, Yale, uh, which is a great uh, article for everyone to uh, read and look, look over. Um, I think we had one TQ or uh, quiz question from our quiz or our uh, trivia night the other night. How many angiosomes of the foot are there? And the uh, six angiosomes are, are well described and uh, delineated um, uh, in that article. What's important about angiosomes is when we do flaps, we, re we, uh, we rob Peter to pay Paul. So we take an area which has good blood supply, Peter, and then we move that area to um, somewhere that does not have good blood supply, which you know, causing the wound uh, or the, the, um, the blood supply was disrupted from one way or the other. So when we move these uh, um, areas, we wanna make sure we're taking good blood supply from a good angiosome and moving it to an area with bad blood supply. Now, this is why I go into the um, uh, arterial supplies and looking at ABIs, PVRs, uh, and the uh, waveforms, because you, you, you really need to look at each arterial supply and make sure that that arterial supply is adequate to, um, to heal the new wound and then um, also to heal the wound um, that you, you know, you're taking soft tissue and bone from one area and moving it to the other. You need to make sure that area has enough blood supply to heal itself afterwards. I'm gonna go into a couple foot flaps that we, um, we well, we're gonna be focusing on leg flaps today in the lab portion. Um, but it's uh, important to look at, um, you know, from uh, all the different kind of flaps that we uh, can utilize in the foot, ankle, and leg. <clears throat> the abductor digiti minimi is a great flap for a lateral um, uh, foot coverage uh, whenever you have bone exposure or hardware exposure. Uh, this is um, one of our type 2 muscle bellies. You have, um, you can see here from the depiction on the right hand of the screen, the um, perforators. You have the main artery that's coming down. Um, from the lateral, the you know, uh, posterior tibial artery uh, to the lateral um, uh, plantar artery, and those little perforators, so those little branches, are extremely important. That's what's supplying the blood, venous, and arterial to that muscle. And you need to make sure that you're keeping intact um, two, three, sometimes four, if you can, all of the uh, perforators to keep that blood supply coming in and out of that muscle whenever you transpose it. I have here just a um, uh, what that muscle looks like when you take it out of the body and then a radiographic angio uh, view uh, of that blood coming in um, from its main supply. And see here how even though the muscle belly is removed, you can see those that blood flow still continues to go down uh, into the entire muscle, even though you transect those other little perforators that go into the, um, uh, into the muscle. This is a great um, uh, multiple different arcs that you can make with this, um, with this muscle itself. Uh, you can both transpose it distally and proximally. So this can be a distally or proximally based flap uh, and detach it either one, dis distal or proximal, and flap that or transpose that from one area to the other. Um, this is just showing how uh, you can uh, keep those distal most perforators and make it a distally based flap and detach it proximally and then cover an area on the plantar or lateral or dorsal aspect of that lateral, um, that lateral foot. 
Um, this is a cadaver um, depiction. This is a latex injected limb. You can see here the, uh, the red portions um, being the arterial supply, and you can kind of see all the uh, uh, perforators that are going into that <clears throat> for the blood supply. And this is just a case showing an abductor dig digity minimi flap um, for complications from uh, dehiscence uh, from a, um, a calcaneal fracture, and then um, seeing how that can cover up uh, an area that is dehisced or an area that you know has exposed hardware, exposed bone uh, to cover that area and fill that big void uh, that's missing on the lateral portion of the foot. This is another case um, uh, of a uh, non-healing uh, wound that um, had underlying osteo. Um, looking at the literature, there's um, great case studies and literature um, using flaps to actually treat the osteomyelitis. When you look at osteomyelitis and exposed bone, exposed hardware, what are we missing from those? We're missing oxygen perfusion, blood flow, and coverage. And when you bring a, when you rob Peter to pay Paul, when you bring a well vascularized area and put it to a non vascularized area, that blood flow now allows for antibiotics, your, your body's defense mechanisms to fight off that infection and penetrate that bone, penetrate that hardware that uh, may be exposed. Um, so that's kind of the idea of flaps treating osteomyelitis is you're bringing the area, all the things that it needs to heal, whether it's antibiotics, um, uh, arterial supply, um, oxygen supply. Here's the um, dissection for this, taking the abductor digiti minimi um, and placing it distally. Uh, and then about after three, um, three weeks, getting that healed. Um, and then obviously monitoring osteomyelitis um, with our CRPs to make sure that that level comes down um, after the surgery. FHB muscle bellies are um, um, very useful uh, in covering our heel wounds. I like these for our, our straight plantar heel wounds that we can't get uh, offloaded or, you know, um, some of these patients have um, Overlengthened Achilles tendons from a previous procedure or a neglected, uh, I'm sorry, a neglect, neglected Achilles ruptures, um, which have that void or that wound on the plantar aspect of the foot. So here's our blood supply into it. Uh, very, um, it can be a very a bulbous muscle that's extremely um, useful for filling the voids. Um, here it's just showing how you can transect at the tendinous portions, which are non vascularized or minimally vascularized. Um, and then using that blood supply <clears throat> to uh, cover the area and uh, heal the wound. Here's a cadaver lab, or sorry, cadaver foot, you, uh, showing how um, nice and, and beefy that muscle can be to cover that wound and fill that void. Um, and here's just a case presentation showing that uh, the dissection for a flexor um, a digitorum brevis muscle uh, flap, um, cutting out that, that wound. Uh, and then filling it with the uh, muscle belly itself um, uh, to get good coverage. I should put that other place in there. That would be cool. Um, you do? Awesome. Um, so we'll go, um, uh, Dr. Blanton has that, that case to show you too. Abductor hallucis muscle um, is a great, I, I love using this muscle to cover uh, medial column wounds, especially after um, elective um, the dehiscences, God forbid you get one. Um, lapidus procedures, etc. Whenever you have good dehiscence, uh, you can have great coverage uh, for these um, for these deficits. The abductor hallucis is uh, much like the um, adductor digiti minimi, minimi uh, where you can uh, make it a distally or proximally based flap, uh, which can be transposed both distally and proximally. Um, again, here's our uh, our depiction in the cadaver and um, our angio view of it. Um, and then just to show the cadaver uh, dissection of it, um, you can kind of see on the uh, uh, top left portion of the screen. Uh, so that's our abductor hallucis um, uh, bre brevis, um, which is covering all the way up almost to the medial mouth for a wound. So you can kind of see uh, how versatile that wound could be too. Um, just to kind of depict, uh, this is uh, from um, one of my colleagues and buddies, um, uh, Dr. Masada down in Cincinnati, 
Uh, this is an exposed hardware where he used a um, uh, abductor hallucis muscle belly uh, to cover up that ex uh, exposed hardware, um, cover, it, cover it up, skin graft on top, and get that to heal without having to remove the hardware, um, which was um, you know, non-infected and, and not loose. Our medial plantar artery flaps are um, extremely versatile too. I'm hoping to possibly go through that today if we have enough time uh, on, the, um, on the, the cadaver. If not, we'll do it next time. Uh, medial plantar artery flaps are kind of a, a great go-to for uh, large deficits on the plantar foot, medial foot, um, uh, arguably lateral foot, but especially the posterior plantar heel. Um, and we'll see here how uh, that arterial supply uh, can be tra uh, transected um, all the way to cover a medial malleolus uh, if need be. Um, so this is a um, uh, main supply, uh, is coming from the medial plantar artery, um, hence its uh, name of the flap. Um, and what's important here um, is this is not a muscle flap. So this is a, um, a fascia cutaneous flap, so we're taking everything from that plantar fascia all the way up to the uh, layer of the skin. And then the blood supply, which runs straight through that, the medial plantar artery runs straight through that uh, that sandwich um, and, and making sure to maintain that uh, throughout the dissection. This is a textbook uh, depiction of, um, uh, of the dissection itself, um, but here's a, um, oh, no, not that one. Um, here's kind of a, another textbook showing how the uh, lateral plantar heel, um, there's the uh, transection of everything between the skin and that plantar fascia, um, and then on E or the bottom, uh, left-hand screen, you can see that um, posterior tibial artery connecting up to the medial plantar artery and then supplying that flap. So all of that, um, all that soft tissue is um, supplied by the, um, the medial plantar artery. This is a cadaver lab that I, a uh, cadaver dissection I did for um, uh, utilizing um, the medial plantar artery flap. That's the dissection. Um, and then kind of um, where the pickups are there, that's showing the arterial venous and uh, uh, neuro supply that goes to that, um, that medial plantar artery flap. Um, and that shows a little bit better, kind of all the perfusion of the arterial portions. Um, and then the transection um, all the way to cover, I think that's the medial malleolus malleol that that's covering. Um, but you can see here how it can go to the plantar medial heel. And if you transect it a little bit more proximal, uh, it can be swung over to cover the lateral portion of the heel. Here's one of my cases for a, excuse me, a, uh, a plantar heel uh, deficit. This patient had a, a wound uh, since, oh God, dinosaurs roam, roam the earth. Um, so after taking out all the, the dead necrotic tissue and the dead necrotic bone, um, you know, one of our benefits of using a medial plantar artery flap is matching we call like to like so we have plantar skin which takes a lot of beating and and you know weight bearing taking plantar skin and moving it to where was plantar skin so like to like um, which is a great benefit of of doing this versus a split thickness skin graft which is a not and not as great um, of weight bearing um, so you don't want that that split thickness skin graft to shear off uh, so this is a great flap to use for like-to-like -to -like matching. Um, there's my uh, uh, transposition of the flap to the plantar heel. You can see on the edges, there's a little bit of bluing or um, venous congestion. Uh, so ended up popping a couple of those sutures um, and then um, uh, stabilizing it with an external fixator, uh, not only for uh, motion prevention, uh, but also uh, to protect that heel. Uh, any pressure on that heel is going to be detrimental to the flap uh, and will end up necrosing it. So uh, especially, you know, unless you're making the patient lay on their belly for the, the next uh, few weeks, um, you're obviously going to uh, need to offload that area. Um, and this is the patient <clears throat> two and a half months later uh, after the flap had taken. Um, and then uh, that skin graft, which was on the uh, previous medial uh, plantar fascia area uh, heals up really nicely with a, a split thickness skin graft. 
Obviously, like I said, the split thickness skin graft isn't great for weight bearing, but luckily that medial arch is not a weight bearing um, a surface of the patient. So they're able to walk on this, they're able to walk on their heel uh, after a few more months with added protection um, uh, in their you know, um, uh, AFO or um, offloading device or um, boot. So a shout out to Jaws here. So sometimes these flaps aren't big enough, right? So the muscles can only uh, cover so much given how big they are or how large or blood supply that they have as well. Um, so here's a couple leg flaps or um, uh, lateral and medial leg flaps that um, I just wanted to kind of show um, if we have any, uh, uh, you know, I want to get you guys involved with patients. So um, if anyone wants to chime in uh, on this patient, um, kind of like different options to use, et cetera. So we have a 61 year old female. She has um, a diabetic <clears throat> insulin dependent for um, over 20 years probably well over 20 years. Um, but anyway, she had a 13 month wound uh, on the plantar aspect of her uh, left medial heel, uh, an ulceration with underlying osteo. Um, so someone, I'd like someone for, uh, from the audience to chime in on, on some options for this. So this is a uh, um, kind of a upshot or a wound care center shot as I um, call it for the wound itself. Come on, I'm not moving until someone volunteers. Don't try to call my bluff. I'm really not moving on until someone volunteers. I've been talking for way too long. Do you just want us to describe the wound? Yeah, and describe what uh, kind of plans you want or would would do for the patient, almost like a workup. So you, like Dee kind of said in the chat, you have a wound here with a granular base and a fibrotic edge. Um, I might be misorienting myself, but it looks like plantar heel. Mm -hmm, correct. Um, so I would go into an offload. Uh, then from that, I don't know. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, the patient's been uh, in total contact casts and everything under the sun for offloading. Um, at this point, too, she has a 13-month-old wound, so she has a, a pretty decent osteo uh, infection in her calcaneus. So we obviously have to address uh, that portion, too, because, um, you know, uh, she went through a three-month, I think, um, stent of uh, IV antibiotics, which is, has clearly not uh, resolved the wound or or her. Um, so she needs like an IV. Okay. Um, so I, you know our our first you know plan of attack or or whatever uh, after um, looking at the patient is to to get some good imaging, uh, MRI, CT, and um, yeah. uh, uh, vascular, um, and it showed that she did have cal calcaneal osteo um, about. Uh, probably less than than 25% of her her plantar heel, which correlates um, with the wound. So, right on this view, this is a medial, more medial wound. So it's uh, plantar, medial, and posterior. So that's how how big that is. So um, after we get you know all this stuff, um, and obviously her her offloading hasn't done anything for her for uh, months and months at a time. Uh, we decided to do 
Uh, so this is a um, uh, medial um, hemisoleus. So this is half of the soleus muscle that's taken um, and then transposed from the proximal portion uh, down to the plantar uh, aspect of the heel. Uh, and um, if you're not grasping that concept, that's okay. We're gonna go through that in the lab anyway. Um, but this is a, um, a medial hemisoleus flap uh, that's utilized to cover the area. So here you can see uh, her void is uh, completely covered. Um, the anesthesiologist is, is awaiting us saying we're done. Um, but we uh, stabilize that first with an external fixator. Uh, this is just showing the incision for the flap itself uh, to harvest the uh, soleus muscle, the medial portion of the soleus muscle. This just shows her, um, uh, so after her flap, uh, this is 18 month uh, follow up. So um, uh, she's obviously in accommodative shoe gear. Uh, she has uh, one of those deep heel uh, AFOs because uh, you, know, you have to remember she did lose part of her, her calcaneus. Uh, so her gait is significantly altered uh, and you have to compensate with that even though it it looks full uh, of a previous calcaneus it's not so you have to make sure uh, that their gait is well controlled with a um, with an afo our second case here um, i'm i'm showing just uh, to show you that not not everything uh, we do goes fantastic um, so 67 year old female uh, originally, back in the 70s, she had a trimalleal or ankle fracture, uh, which went uh, ORIF fixed. Um, I do want someone to chime in to talk about her x-rays. So we'll uh, go into, uh, so this is obviously injury in the 70s, uh, but this is her current state um, of uh, x-rays. Now, I will give you the, the cheat sheet. She did not have an ankle fusion. Um, so can someone read this uh, AP and lateral for me? Uh, of this patient. So this is what, almost you know, 35, but at the time of the surgery, about 35, maybe uh, 40 years uh, post-injury. So who wants to take uh, this x-ray and give me, give me a good, like quick and dirty uh, uh, read of it? Sure. Um, two views, AP lateral, uh, dorsal osteophytes noted on the Taylor head as well as the navicular dorsal aspect. The ankle, you said, is either severely arthritic or you said it wasn't fused, but I'm not seeing any sign of an ankle joint whatsoever. Correct. Um, hardware seems intact. Uh, posterior calcaneus. Is that like an osteophyte formation going Proximally? So um, are you talking about the posterior aspect of the talus? Yes, I'm sorry, the talus. So um, that's, that's uh, a post-traumatic arthritis that's forming between the talus and the subtalar joint. Um, later imaging shows uh, that she does have uh, essentially a fusion of that subtalar joint posterior facet, posterior portion. Um, so she actually has no pain in her subtalar joint, surprisingly, even though it looks Chlorotic on both of the facet um, articulations. Uh, she doesn't have any pain there because it's pseudo fused. Um, unfortunately, that was the only joint that did not, good, good read on the x ray, uh, did not fuse. So uh, her CT scan, like I said, showed no um, uh, joint space and a essentially fusion of her subtalar joint. But her ankle joint had like two cells of cartilage um, between the two uh, bones. So she had range of motion and it, it sounded like broken glass going back and forth. Um, so <clears throat> her options, obviously, um, she's looking at uh, a fusion uh, versus a total ankle. Um, for, for her, she essentially has a fusion with pain and she um, hated it, didn't want to even talk about a fusion. Uh, after multiple different uh, opinions, she had a, um, couple fusion options given to her and, and uh, no uh, total ankle replacements. So she decided to go with a total ankle, which is one of the things I uh, offered to her. So it's essentially a, a fusion takedown um, uh, into a, uh, sorry, into a total ankle replacement. Um, so 
this x-ray here just shows my um, uh, post-op intra-op uh, films. Um, this is uh, that fibular screw just, you know, obviously didn't realize that it wasn't uh, all the way in. So before we closed her up, we put that screw all the way in. Um, this was one of my first ankle fusion takedowns. Uh, so the residents were, um, no, this is a, uh, yes, it is an inf um, infinity. We use the prophecy for it. I think it's actually an in-bone Taylor component and an infinity video component. Um, so Did you have uh, to rebreak the posterior portion of the tails to free it from the calcaneus, or did you uh, leave it semi-fused? Yep, just leave it semi-fused. It's not going to move, um, and it's you know if we did break up that that pseudo fusion or that fusion in the posterior post traumatic fusion, uh, most likely it would cause her pain. So we just left that alone. Um, my resident who worked with me uh, is kind of a big guy, so I like to compare it to uh, James and then me. Uh, the smaller uh, basketball player. We were bumping chests in the back, super excited about it. Um, unfortunately, this is what her first post-op looked like. So this bumping was a little premature. Um, she had uh, um, what, what was found out later on to be um, from her initial injury back in the 70s, uh, there was um, trauma to her anterior tibial artery. Uh, which transected it, so she had no anterior tib artery past um, you know, distal portion of her one third of her tibia, uh, and then no dorsalis pedis um, until the level of where the skin looks great. So um, anyway, uh, what are we going to do with this? Um, I decided to um, obviously remove all the necrotic tissue and then cover this with a um, perineus brevis flap. Um, so this is kind of, you know, this is to show these are not all just diabetic patients uh, that you can utilize this on. You can use it with your elective cases that uh, need coverage that go wrong. So uh, this is a perineus brevis flap um, transected. You can see right above where my um, scissors are, my Metzenbaum scissors, um, just showing one of the perforators that's coming into the, uh, to the muscle belly itself. Um, this was a tunneled flap. Um, I don't tunnel anymore, but um, this is a, uh, a tunneled brevis flap. You can see a great coverage uh, overlying the uh, anterior portion um, of that uh, exposed hardware. Um, covered that with a uh, initial split, th split thickness skin graft uh, and then framed over top of it to stabilize and make sure that muscle uh, can take before you start moving that ankle again. I did leave, leave all the um, hardware in uh, for her total ankle. Um, and then a um, couple uh, weeks later, um, uh, she was doing pretty well. Um, this is a six month post muscle flap. Um, she had most of it um, healed, took a really long time for the skin graft to take um, and super excited. Uh, and then about four months after um, she healed the actual flap um, and she was walking on it, uh, twisted her ankle and snapped. Um, her medial lateral mal, that is not the way that a post-op um, total ankle is supposed to look. Um, oh, good question. We'll go over uh, muscle, muscle functioning after a flap because uh, you have to do some adjunct procedures after you sacrifice those muscles. Um, so anyway, uh, no more chest pumping. This is uh, uh, kind of a limb salvage at this point. Um, so I ended up taking out her uh, total ankle uh, completely. Um, there it is, um, laying on the back table, um, put in an antibiotic spacer just to make sure there was no residual infection, um, and mini railed over, uh, or mono railed over top of that. Um, and there's the antibiotic spacer that you can see where the talus and por portion of the tibia used to be. Um, and then, <clears throat> uh, later on down, uh, after about six weeks, um, exchanging an antibiotic spacer, um, uh, did a, uh, essentially calcaneal tibial fusion, a blair fusion, um, and then did tibial lengthening, which you can see on the, the top left of the screen, um, but kind of on the bottom of that picture, you can see the tibial osteotomy for the lengthening uh, because of the enormous defect that we took out. Um, and there's the um, uh, frame that um, lengthens, sorry, the frame that lengthens, lengthens the tibia um, gradually over the course of um, about three months.
I want Dr. Bland to go through her cases, so I'm going to fly through these really quick. Um, we are doing uh, today in the lab a gastroc flap. Here's a, um, uh, a patient with a exposed tibia um, all the way down to bone. Uh, the vascular surgeon and I worked on this patient. He, ironically, he did the TMA and I did the uh, gastroc flap for him. Um, here's just uh, sh uh, showing the wound itself and the, the exposed tibia. Um, here's the, on the top uh, left hand of your screen, you can see the, the um, gastroc muscle itself. It wasn't long enough, so that is a striations that I make into the fascia to lengthen the muscle belly um, and lengthen the muscle to be able to uh, cover as much um, area as you can, essentially doing a couple gastroc lengthenings on the gastroc muscle, uh, just not for an Aquinas deformity. There's the muscle tunnel under uh, and covering the wound itself, uh, and then about six weeks post-op during the skin graft. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one. Um, this is just a transposition. We won't be doing um, a random pattern flaps today, but this is just a random, platter, random pattern flap uh, to cover a wound. Um, and then finally, just this is um, uh, showing an adipal fascial flap um, uh, to cover, um, this is a deformed, I don't know, messed up TMA that um, somebody uh, uh, did and uh, was uh, sent over to cover this medial foot. Um, is an adipal fascial flap, um, the dissection for it, the, the harvesting of it, so that big hunk of muscle um, in my hand um, is gonna be transposed down to the um, uh, medial foot. Uh, there's Dr. Rizante uh, on the left-hand screen um, staring at me because we're taking pictures. Um, and then a, a frame to um, uh, stabilize it. One final thing is just um, a kind of a review of what, what makes these flaps kind of difficult. Um, I do, uh, um, you do need to realize that, um, you know, the foot's one of the hardest, this is from the plastic surgery textbooks, one of the hardest areas to reconstruct due to the vascular ply and the increase in venous pressure in trying to manage the edema. And an angiogram is recommended, um, especially if pulses are not palpable um, or dopperable. And I think angios are, or at least a CT angio uh, is um, very beneficial with flap planning. Um, and elevation and non weight bearing uh, for at least four weeks post op is extremely important. Um, I have a, a question on the chat room why isn't tunneling done anymore? Um, I stopped tunneling um, uh, due to uh, venous occlusion with tunneling. Um, so every time, <clears throat> not every time, but a lot of times when the patient swells postoperatively, everything in the leg swells and it, it pushes against that flap, which is, has nowhere to go because the skin is keeping it down. Um, so what happens is those veins are, are, are such pushable or, or pliable um, that what can happen is major venous congestion uh, that can stop the outflow of blood and then cause um, a venous congested flap, which either will partially die, um, tip necrosis, or uh, die completely. So uh, I've gone away from uh, my tunneling and, and just essentially opening up the fascial planes and moving the, um, uh, the muscle uh, or the adipal fascial or the fascial cutaneous and um, overlying it over uh, top of the skin, uh, or like I said, making almost like a runway uh, for that um, soft tissue to sit on. Hey, Dr. Bland's going to show her um, presentation real fast. I'm going to flip it over and then she can take over before we go to our um, uh, cadaver lab. Hopefully, everyone can see that now. Oops. All right, hi everybody. Um, I know Dr. Clarity introduced me, but um, one thing I wanted to mention here was I, I came from University of Cincinnati for a residency under Dr. Masada. And I know flaps can be very intimidating and almost overwhelming to the point where you think I'll never do this. I remember sitting there in my chair, actually first year residency, and Dr. Masada first became our director and him giving the first lecture to us. And I had very little 
um, knowledge of flaps at all, other than maybe one lecture I had in school. And I was thinking, I'll never do this. And now it's come to the point where it's my favorite thing and um, it's, I feel very confident in it. And I give thanks to, you know, Dr. Masada and all, and Dr. Clarity and everyone that's helped me along my path with this. But even for those that are not going to a flap heavy residency, um, you know, there's still ways to learn this through flap, or conferences like class, um, or even if you have no interest at all, um, just recognizing that um, limbs are salvageable. When a lot of times people will say it's not salvageable is a, is a huge thing and um, a huge benefit to patients. So um, just keep it in mind, even if you don't want to do them, um, know who you can refer to, um, whether it's a podiatrist or a plastic surgeon or whatnot. So um, just to kind of, I know Dr. Clarity mentioned muscle flaps already. I kind of want to just sum it down here um, just for the same fact that I know this is overwhelming and talk about why we choose muscle flaps over amplifacial flap or fascial cutaneous flap or a random flap or anything of that nature and, and kind, of, um, kind of simplify it. So indications for muscle flaps, uh, big thing is complex wounds. So um, deep wounds, things that are, uh, where bones exposed is a huge thing. When tendons exposed, like in this top right corner, um, that was after a TIR that we did in fellowship and um, there was no peritinon on the tendon itself. So um, trying to get that to granulate over um, would be almost near impossible or very, very slow. And when you have implant in there, you have, you have to always worry about getting that covered because of the quick risk of infection. Um, also the management of osteomyelitis, uh, the muscle itself is very dense in capillaries and it can serve as a antibiotic conduit even though do not rely on cleaning infection with the flap um, but that's another benefit to muscle flaps and also recalcitrant uh, venous stasis ulcers that sometimes you'll see these venous stasis ulcers last for years and years and years and they're coming from they come to you from a wound care center and you know, they've had this for three years and they're just getting fed up with it. And this is um, something that you can offer them. Um, side note, this uh, picture here on the left, that was a melanoma case um, that we did a big debridement on. And uh, we actually did a meal plantar artery flap on that. But just so you guys know, it's, it's, they're very, muscle flaps are very valuable in many ways and to cover uh, deep wounds. So versatility and advantages to muscle flaps over the fascial cutaneous and apofascial. Um, they're very well vascularized, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so when, say when Dr. Clarity and I are discussing a case, a lot of times we like to go to muscle flaps first just because they're so reliable. Um, sometimes apofascial flaps and fascial cutaneous flaps, um, you'll see partial thickness necrosis or complete necrosis and muscle flaps are just reliable just because how vascularized they are. Um, also, because they're so vascularized, um, there's less venous congestion that we encounter, which is the number one, often the number one cause of uh, why flaps do necrose. They just have this back um, congestion of the blood and, and, they, and they end up necrosing. And then the other thing, like I already mentioned too, is it's a great antibiotic conduit. Um, there's also many selections. So you have muscles in the foot that you can utilize and also on the lower extremity, although not all of them, which I'll get into. Um, they're malleable and they're bulky. So if you have a deep space, fascial cutaneous flaps and antiprofessional flaps, especially if the patients are thin, um, they tend to be thin. So you wanna, Kind of think more go muscle because they are bulkier, especially if you're doing like a hemisoleus flap, uh, gastroc flap. Those are pretty bulky. Proteus brevis flap, depending on your patient, can be thin, but um, it, it can be bulky as well. And also, there are studies out there that say they provide more rapid collagen deposition and greater tissue ingrowth than the other flaps. So, flap selection. Um, so, when you're deciding which muscle flap to do, you kind of want to break it down to location. So divide the tibia into proximal, middle, and distal. So if you're doing proximally, um, a great flap to do is a medial or lateral gastroc flap, which I'll go into why. Um, middle, soleus, or tibialis anterior. Uh, distally, reverse base hemisoleus, or reverse base peroneus brevis. 
heal. You can do those distally based ones as well, but then abductor hallucis, uh, flexor digitorum brevis, and the abductor digitorum minimi. And then lateral foot, abductor digitorum minimi, and also the EDB can be um, a good source. And then medial foot, the abductor hallucis. So I didn't mention like the FDL, um, FHL, EHL, EDL. Um, so you may ask why. And the biggest thing is it's based on this Matthew and Nehi uh, classification, which if you want to get into flaps, you really got to put this to memory because um, if you choose the wrong type, your flap will die. So um, in the leg, so first I'll go through the type. So type one, you have one major dominant uh, pinnacle. Um, type two, you have one major one that's on the proximal end of the muscle belly, on the muscle belly, and then some minor uh, pinnacles distally. Um, type three, you have two uh, kind of major pedicles there, um, no minor. Type four is kind of called a segmental muscle flap, and it's based on um, this multiple segmental or multiple minor uh, pedicles going to the muscle. And then type five, you have a major pedicle and then lots of minor pedicles as well. So when we're talking about the leg um, and the foot for that matter, the ones that we typically use are the type two muscles. So um, this kind where you have the major pedicle up here and then the minor below. The thing is since, this is, since this is typically or always proximally the major pedicle, um, you may ask if we bag that one, what's gonna happen with the rest? Well, the thing with the type two is these minor ones, if you preserve enough of them, um, or a minimum at least one, um, often that muscle will survive. You may have a little bit distal tip necrosis, but you'll have enough blood flow. Where if you go to a type four, which is the other type in the leg, um, if you, if once you're starting to ligate these when you're trying to reflect, you ligate, you ligate this one, this area is gonna die here. You ligate this one, this area is gonna die here. So it's not really um, providing perfusion throughout the whole muscle. And that's why they're very difficult um, and challenging to use. So when we're talking about the foot, good thing is all intrinsic muscles are type two. So you can use them um, proximally or reverse, or proximally in a reverse fashion or distally. And then with the leg, um, the gas track is a type one, but you're usually use, using that in a proximal manner. So they, that one just has one major pedicle and you, as long as you reflect off and make sure you keep that, um, that flap is amazing. And then type two, um, you have the peroneus brevis and the peroneus longus. Um, I've never done the longest before just because that muscle belly is so high up and if you're reflecting it down, um, it doesn't cover much. But the brevis is a great, really great one to use and it, probably the easiest one to do. Um, and then you have the soleus, which is a type two, which um, if you're going proximally, you can take you know the whole way or transpose it in a certain way, or if you're going distally, you can do what's called a hemisoleus where you cut a little bit over half of it um, to maintain the, the, the blood supply there. And so type four, um, we do utilize the tibat, but I won't go too much into it. You can use it in a split way. Um, and kind of reverse it down. But if you can go with the other ones, it's probably best. But tibialis anterior is one that, type four that we can use, but the EHL and the flexors and the tibialis posterior um, don't do it. So you might have heard of this 5, 10, 15 rule. And the importance of this is exactly why the Mathis and Nehi classification um, is helpful. So you have, in general, the perforators come in at the five centimeter mark, and this five centimeter mark is from the ankle joint. So it's not if you're doing a uh, peroneus brevis flap laterally. You're not measuring from the styloid process. You're measuring from the ankle joint. So um, you have this perforator generally around this five centimeter mark, five centimeter mark here, and then one at the 10, 15, and 20. Sorry, I was supposed to get 20. And here is actually a case we did about two weeks ago is a hemisoleus flap. You can see it's kind of a poor quality picture, but there's a perforator here, one here, and one here. So as we're reflexing, we're ligating this one, the 15 one, 
try to keep it 10 minutes if you can, but a lot of times you can't depending on how uh, distally you're trying to reach. And then definitely keep the five. So just pearls that I've kind of learned along the way and from my mentors and everything like that in consideration. So when you're doing uh, muscle flaps and when you're doing it in a reverse manner, or reflecting it distally um, from the leg, um, you'll typically get that t distal end necrosis. And that reason is for you, lo you lost that major pedicle um, in that area of the muscle. So a lot of times those minor pedicles will not get to that extent. So remember that because um, like Dr. Clarity showed before, when you're, when you're doing a, a muscle flap, you have the aponeurosis and if you resect it, like kind of like a gastroc resection, um, you can get more length. So if you're flipping up, a flap down and you're like, okay, it reaches. Don't just get to reach. If you can, go even further. Because just kind of ex expect there's gonna be some distal end necrosis to be on the safe side. Um, also, same thing, um, kind of go longer if you can, because you may see some contracture. You more see that with the fascial cutaneous and apofascial flaps, but you'll get some with the muscle as well. Um, do the aponeurosis resection to get length. Um, a lot of times too, we're using the SPI interop, and the SPI, if you've never heard of it, um, you essentially put um, a fluorescent dye, the anesthesiologist put a fluorescent dye um, into the vasculature, and it runs down into your lower extremity, and you'll see um, the green fluorescence show up on kind of like a mini C arm, and you'll see blood supplied to your muscle or your flap or whatever you're doing. If you, if you do not see that, that may be when you wanna delay a flap and kind of set it back down and come back in two weeks to kind of let it calm down, um, kind of open up what's called choke vessels and just kind of improve its, its fascularity before you actually flap it and kind of kink that artery. Um, but you can also use papaverin. So papaverin is an antispasmodic um, injection that you could do and you can just inject it into the muscle, muscle there and that could help. Um, interop or actually postoperatively as well. And then also um, putting warm saline around the, the muscle when you're done and kind of just sitting there, like take a break when you're done with surgery and, and reflecting and um, just kind of let it relax with some warm saline so it can just calm down. Because a lot of times that artery will spasm. Um, and then also another big thing is what's called a dangle protocol. So um, half the battle is doing the flap, but also the other half of the battle is uh, post-operatively and, and how you manage it. If you do not manage it well, um, you're, you could have done the best flap in the world, but it, it's a goner. So biggest thing is venous congestion. So um, we have our patients all follow this thing of protocol, which is um, for six days straight after they're done with the flap. We have them admitted. Um, we try to at least get them admitted for six days they're laying in bed, their bed rests, their leg is up. They are not dangling their leg over the edge of the bed or anything for that matter to prevent the venous congestion. After that day six, day seven, you um, start to increase how much they can dangle it. So like day seven, we do 15 minutes at um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The next day they can increase to 30 minutes at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it increments up. Um, so by two weeks, they're able to sit in their chair and do whatever they need to do. Um, but that's very important. So that's that's kind of the basics there. Um, I did want to kind of take you through some cases that I've done through residency. Um, this one's from residency, the rest are from fellowship, but got a lot more. Um, if you guys are interested, you guys can always email me. I got a big PowerPoint of them. But this one, this was a lady in residency who had this abscess in their Achilles, um, tracking up and also to, uh, to uh, near the calcaneus laterally. So we did a huge uh, aggressive uh, debridement here. And I just wanna tell externs and new residents starting, um, when you're dealing with an infection, you tend to be gun shy at first, at least I was, and you kinda want, you're like, oh, I don't wanna cut this, I don't wanna cut that. The thing with debridement is you wanna be aggressive. Um, you don't wanna leave anything behind. If you're in doubt, take more. Um, and that's a guideline that Will benefit you 100% um, and benefit the patient most importantly. So here we did a big debridement here and we did a wound back for a little bit but we wanted to really cover this up as fast as we could. Um, this is a relatively active patient um, and we want to give her the best life that we could. So 
We did a peroneus brevis flap here, as well as abductor digitae minimi, we brought it this way. But you kind of can see the muscle folded here, and she went on to do great. Um, I know one question that Dr. Clarity got earlier was, um, what happens when you do take a muscle is you do have to consider that you're losing that eversion. So with this, you can do a tenodesis of that tendon uh, distally to the longest to have the extra pull there to maintain that. Or if you think needed, you could always do a lengthening or just a tenotomy of the PT to balance things out. So you do want to consider that. And she went up, she went on to heal completely. This was a Shaco case and she was walking very um, embarrassed and she developed this lateral mal wound. Um, we did a big excision like you see here. Because a lot of times you say, you can see like, oh, that looks granular, it looks healthy. It's not. It's been there for a year. Um, it's not healthy tissue and you gotta really cut it out. Um, so we did a brevis flap here and she was a bigger lady. So this muscle was actually pretty bulky. Um, your brevis flap, not all the time will be this big, but she went on to do great. And now she is riding on her tractor and doing wonderful. So um, here's another one where there was hard, hardware intact or hardware um, exposed um, from a Sharko recon. And this, we actually did tunnel the abductor hallucis muscle. Um, that's one time Dr. Clardy did do that, but he, or sh yeah, he went on to heal as well. Here's the FDB. So this guy had a shark bow. Um, essentially what happened, he, he got a femoral head allograft by another, uh, another doctor, but he got fused in a dorsiflex position. So he had a calcaneal gait and developed this wound to his plantar heel that um, lasted for years and years. So he presented to us, we ended up doing kind of did um, a double double case with Dr. Highlander, my, my other fellow director who does a lot of recon stuff. Um, we did a Sharko recon and then we took this FDB um, and flipped it down. We also were um, putting a nail in this though, so we were really careful to kind of reflect it um, medially while still keeping one of the pedicles there because um, we did have to bag the lateral pedicle that goes into the FDB. So that was kind of a meticulous dissection, but he did fantastic. And then this is a look one we did about two weeks ago, um, huge calcaneal osteo. Uh, we did a massive debridement, which you need to do. And um, we did a, a medial hemisoleus for that. You could say, why didn't we do um, a medial plantar artery flap? Because you do have that weight bearing skin, which Dr. Clarity mentioned, it's that like with like skin. So you could have argued to do that. Um, one thing about her is, you know, she had, not the best vasculature. So we kind of wanted to stare away from the medial plantar artery flap because it is a great flap when it works. But like I mentioned before, um, muscle flaps are, um, they've been a little bit more successful in our hands. So that's how we did that. And that's all. So we'll get on to other members. All right, so um, I am gonna put up our uh, Facebook page, give me one second. One second, please hold. That's done. Okay, so this is where we want everyone to uh, go to. So this is our Facebook page. We'll be doing Facebook Live at 1.15. So give us about four or five minutes to set up. You can go there now. Um, so it's CLE Specialist Facebook page. Um, and again, if you have to jump off or whatever, uh, we'll eventually put this on YouTube for everyone to see. Uh, but if you wanna ask questions and stuff, we're gonna have doctors um, running the chat room. <clears throat> so if you wanna ask, uh, Dr. Corey, um, myself, or Dr. Bland, any questions, you just um, uh, obviously hop on that page and then in the chat, uh, just ask questions. So we'll see you there. And I'll leave this up for everyone to, to log into.